Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 22 of Ben Franklin's World the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. Have you ever heard the saying that behind every great man stands a great woman? Benjamin Franklin was a really great man, So I guess it should not surprise us that he had not one, but two great women standing behind him. His wife, Deborah Reed Franklin, and his daughter, Sally Franklin Beche. In today's episode, we explore the lives of these two great women with Vivian Bruce Conger, the Robert Ryan Professor in the Humanities at Ithaca College, and author of a forthcoming book about the lives of Deborah Reed Franklin and Sally Franklin Beche. During our conversation, Vivian reveals who Deborah Reed Franklin and Sally Franklin Beche were as women and how their lives assisted Benjamin Franklin's work as a printer, statesman, scientist, and diplomat, what it was like for Deborah Reed to be married to Benjamin Franklin, and how Franklin's politics, as well as the experiences of the American Revolution, influenced Deborah and Sally's involvement in politics. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Vivian Bruce Conger. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Vivian Bruce Conger is the Robert Ryan Professor in the Humanities at Ithaca College. Her research interests include early American history and women's history. Vivian is the author of The Widow's Might, Widowhood and Gender in British America, and the author of the forthcoming book, which she's tentatively titled, The Worlds of Deborah Reed Franklin and Sally Franklin Beche, Transgenerational Lives in Colonial and Revolutionary Philadelphia. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Vivian. Thank you, Liz. It's an honor to be here. I'm really excited to learn that you're writing a book about Deborah Reed Franklin and Sally Franklin Beche, who happen to be the wife and daughter of Benjamin Franklin. Because as you know, throughout history, there have been great men, but where you find a great man, a man, you always find a great woman by his side. That's that's very true. And it's really interesting when I go to Philadelphia, how much Deborah and Sally are not present in in um, the tours around the city. I've said to people, I'm doing research on Deborah Franklin, and they go, "Who?" And so it's, it's I'm excited to be doing it as well. So would you tell us a bit about yourself and how you came to study Deborah Reed Franklin and Sally Franklin Beche when few people have ever heard of them? Okay, I'd be glad to do that. Um, well, as you said, I, I, my specialty is American women's history and gender history. And um, so I'm always interested in learning about women's lives and the role they play in the world around them. And so after I finished The Widow's Might, I was kind of searching around for my next project. I was a bit adrift. I didn't quite want to do a, as a broad a subject as our uh, research topic as I did with a widow's might. They took me to Massachusetts and Maryland and South Carolina. I thought, okay, let's try to find something a little bit easier to focus in on. So then I read a piece that Michael, Michael Fletcher wrote for uh, the OAH magazine called um, Domesticity, the Human Side of Benjamin Franklin. And in this piece, he talked a great deal about the material goods that Benjamin Franklin had set, sent to Deborah Franklin from England and how Deborah used those goods in their newly built house. Now, at this point, I had no interest in Benjamin Franklin, and I had no idea who Deborah Franklin was. Um, but I teach a senior seminar on consumer culture in early America, and I thought, wow, this might be really something interesting that my students could pursue for their final research paper because the sources are easily accessible, they're printed, and they're available online. And so I started an email conversation with Michael about the Franklins and about material culture. 
Um, but as a women's historian, I became fascinated with Deborah Franklin and gender roles um, in 18th century Philadelphia. Then the journal um, Gender and History put out a conference call for a special topic called Homes and Homecomings. And I started thinking about the Deborah Franklin material. Well, long story short, my students never received the suggestion from me because I became so enthralled with that topic that I started looking more closely at Deborah Franklin um, and pursuing that uh, that data on material culture. And of course, it, it just sort of spread from there as I started reading the letters. And I published my first article on Deborah Franklin in Gender and History in, I believe it was November of 2009. There, I just kept digging into the published and archival materials, and I became convinced that these two women deserve to have their stories told, and I was excited to be the one to do so. So let's dive into their exciting stories. Let's start with Deborah Reed Franklin. Would you tell us about who she was and how she and Benjamin Franklin met? Oh, yeah, that's an interesting story that sort of we learned from his autobiography, which is problematic at best in, in some instances. But so Deborah Reed Franklin was the daughter of Sarah White Reed and John Reed. And her parents were born in England, her mother in Birmingham and her father in London. Um, they lived uh, apparently in Birmingham because they immigrated to Philadelphia from Birmingham. It's not clear, in fact, if Deborah was born in England or in Philadelphia. As for many people, especially many women, and at this time, birth records for her do not exist. So we're just not sure exactly where she was born. But um, we know from um, Benjamin's autobiography that he met Deborah in 1723 when he arrived in Philadelphia from Boston. As he tells the story, they became enamored of each other, but her mother disapproved of the match. She thought Benjamin had no real means of support. Um, that he was, in fact, getting ready to leave for England, so why sort of get married now? And she thought both he and Deborah were too young. So he left for England to learn the printing trade, and upon his return, he and Deborah found each other again. Um, but as it turns out, in Benjamin's absence, she had married another man, John Rogers, and he was a local potter. Um, and it seemed to be a, a problematic marriage almost from the beginning. It was rumored at the time that he had a wife in England, um, and then he eventually abandoned Deborah when he set sail for the West Indies, and with him, he took her dowry, and he left her with a huge amount of debt. So as Benjamin says, I pitied poor Miss Reed's unfortunate situation who was generally dejected, seldom cheerful, and avoided company. Um, so uh, when he got back, he, you know, he, she was alone and sort of rightfully so a, a little disconcerted about her situation. But word had had it that her first husband, John Rogers, had died at sea. There was no proof of that. And so Deborah and Benjamin could not legally marry, lest she be charged with bigamy. So they began living together as husband and wife without official sanction by church or court. That is, they uh, began what we would call, and still do, it's still legal in some places, a common law marriage. That is, they just sort of promised that they would marry one another. Um, and this was not unheard of in the 18th century. Um, and as far as I can find, no one looked askance at this common law marriage. They just assumed they were all, they were husband and wife as if they'd been married in a church or in a court. Um, and, uh, everything seemed to work out fine. He said none of the inconveniences happened that we had apprehended. And he said she proved a good and faithful helpmate, um, and so it seemed to me that it was a, a, a good marriage. Did they ever find out whether John Rogers really died at sea or they just never heard from him? No one's ever been able to prove one way or the other whether he died. So we still don't know that. You know, it seems that living together in colonial America without being married seems kind of scandalous. I mean, even in some ways today, it can be kind of scandalous. Is it just the fact that neither Benjamin Franklin nor Deborah Reed Franklin were of the elite class, um, that they didn't have much money, that no one kind of cared if they were living together? Well, now that's an interesting question, and I'm not sure I can answer that, Liz. The class may have something to do with it, but as I said, common law marriage were not 
uncommon in 18th century Philadelphia, so it's not like it would have been seen as really scandalous. And I said, I, I cannot find, I've looked in letters written by people at the time, no one seems to have sort of thought that this was wrong or made any comments about it. So, um, and it may be, that's an, I'll have to think about that actually, about if class was a cover in this situation. Thank you. It's a really interesting point just to think about, you know, you wouldn't think that two people just living together would be okay in that period of time, but it seems like it was okay, which is fascinating. Well, you know, there's, I mean, there, uh, if you look at 18th century law books, there is sort of a legal way that you make a common law marriage. It is, um, you have to say, it has to be in the present tense, for example. Benjamin would say to Deborah, I take thee as my wife. And Deborah would have to say to Benjamin, I take thee as my husband. So in the present tense, if it's stated in the future tense, we will be married or I will take you as my wife, then that's not a legitimate legal common law marriage. But there are rules for it. So um, it's understood and accepted enough for a common law marriage to happen. And were there any legal implications for the fact that they were common law married versus officially married? Again, I've thought a lot about that because we understand the law of coverture and a widow's right uh, to her husband's estate. This is maybe part of the problem and part of the answer is Deborah died before he did. And so we don't know what would have happened as a common law wife if she'd gone to court and um, claimed her share of the property. But he left two or three versions of his will probably every time he left for England, and he cared for her just the way a husband would care for the wife, leaving her um, her share of his land and his goods and, you know, leaving the share to their children. And so it, it seemed as if they both understood this was a legal marriage and operated under those uh, that belief. So it sounds like Deborah first married, you know, a real class act, a real a real jerk. And then Benjamin comes into the picture and saves her. I mean, what's the reality like for Deborah? What is it like to be married to Benjamin Franklin? Does she leave any records that provide any insight into what he was like as a husband? It, well, actually, I, well, I mean, I have a, a nice series of letters written back and forth between them for the times that he, the two different times he was in England. So I have a pretty good sense of who they were as a couple, at least as revealed in letters. So my sense is, and I sort of go back and forth on whether I like Ben or not like Ben, but they they seem to have a good, strong, loving marriage, if you look at the letters. You know, there's a, you know, so these little endearments, he calls her my dear Debbie or my my child, and she calls him my child my, with you know, the salutations to letters. And so they share these little intimacies that a married couple would. Um, and they write back and forth very regularly. It's not like he goes off to England and ignores her and what she's doing, and she writes to him very regularly. So I think they have... Um, a, a caring relationship. Um, there are times I would call Ben, hmm, I guess I might call him sometimes a control freak because even when he's away, when he's in England, he wants her to do things his way. When he sends her goods, he tells her how she should use them and what room they should be put in and um, how they should look. And so he wants her to do things his way. Um, and she does, to some extent, um, listen to him. But then you can kind of hear them have these little almost husband and wife quarrels. I mean, my husband and I sort of quarrel and get snippy with each other at certain times. And I see that in their letters. And so it, it, in some sense, that's a normal relationship to me. But he could be a hard taskmaster for her. And sometimes I think she just didn't want to deal with it. And so she would push back a little bit um, and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care about what you're telling me to do. And um, and she missed him. She wrote a lot about when are you going to come back? I miss you. She'd count sort of on the anniversary. Well, it's been a year since you've been away. It's been two years since you've been away. And so... Um, yes, I think uh, they they had a good relationship. 
Um, he would also be very controlling about the, her money. This is probably when I get the most frustrated with with him, is that you know he has by this point in their life that these letters don't really start in earnest till his second trip to England in 1763. By that time, they're a fairly wealthy couple, and he's got lots of money. And he's in England and he's spending it, but he's watching every penny she's spending in um, Philadelphia telling her when she's spending too much and she's got to learn to live within a budget. And so then that's probably when I get the most frustrated with him. He, he's always a good Yankee. He may have moved to Philadelphia, but he's always a Bostonian. <laughs> that probably is true in terms of what his frugality or his, yes, his pure his upbringing. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's probably true. I mean, he harps. I mean, this is what makes them successful. They're hard as a young couple. They're hardworking. They're frugal. They save their money, they don't get into debt, and they succeed tremendously. And so it's a good life lesson, Um, and he would like to see their lives as a good life lesson. And he always wants to make sure that, you know, he says, when I come back, you know, we're going to be retired, we're not going to have the money we had before, and now we've got to learn how to sort of save our money for the future. So, uh, I mean, it's pretty good advice, actually. I was going to say, it sounds like a conversation my parents and my grandparents have had. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, he's he's known for this anyway when he writes about all this stuff in his, sort of his various pieces and, and in Poor Richard's Almanac. And so he becomes a good lesson for lots of people, actually. Can we explore their rags to riches story for a moment? Sure. I mean, what was their relationship and their even just the work that they did in the household like? when he's an active newspaper print man? And then what is it like after he's retired and he becomes the famous scientist and statesman? I should say the wealthy and famous scientist and statesman. Yeah. it. um, So when they're first starting out in 1730s and 1740s, um, he buys the... Uh, or starts the Pennsylvania Gazette, a wildly successful newspaper. He has a print shop, and he has a shop in the house. And she's really critical to helping him run, particularly the uh, shop in the house. I mean, she's there waiting on customers and taking in money and and keeping records and paying bills. And um, so he's, she's just right there working with him this good frugal sort of housewife that every artisan should have, as he would sort of say. Um, And so uh, she helps them. I mean, they retire. They have enough money to retire in 1748. Wow. So she she really is a key to their success, too. I think she is the key to, and I think he would admit that, actually. I mean, he would brag about the fact that he married well and um, that she helped him. And he... Look, he recognizes it's how much she helped him, how much she sort of worked hard and helped him save money and made it possible for them to retire in um, uh, 1748. Now, of course, historians have sort of said, well, okay, we'll, we'll recognize this early role of Deborah in the family, that she was instrumental up to 1748. And then she sort of gets dropped from the story because um, we don't hear much about her uh, anymore. And he becomes so famous that all the focus is on Ben as a statesman, as a scientist, as a diplomat. He's going to England on various um, trips for, you know, to serve sort of Pennsylvania and Massachusetts and becomes critical in the American Revolution. And it, and it seems that um, she has then taken a back seat. But in fact, if we look at her letters and some account records that she's kept in the 1750s and 60s, um, she's very active economically. It's, she's not working in the shop anymore, indeed. But she's going about Philadelphia. She's sort of making connections for him. She's paying taxes. She's paying rent. Um, She's going to court to uh, settle issues that they might have economically. So she's still critical to his, well, no, 
to their economic well-being and her own economic well-being. I mean, she's there in Philadelphia alone. And in your article, you mentioned she becomes a property mogul of sorts. She buys property and collects rent. She buys property on her own. I mean, she writes them and says, I hope you approve. But in some sense, if you don't, tough, because I bought this land. I mean, she she becomes savvy enough um, to understand what you can do with, I mean, she understands the problems of it too, but that you can buy land and you can rent it out and you can make money that way. People in Philadelphia were sort of making a lot of money renting. Um, and so uh, she knows that and she goes out and does that. This is where you asked me that question about her legal relationship. Um, she's married to Benjamin, but she, she has his power of attorney which is very interesting. I mean, he trusts her enough to say, I'm going off to England, but I've given you power of attorney over my uh, economic well-being. And she runs with it in some sense and starts making decisions on her own. And she becomes a really sort of powerful voice for the family. She's she's walking around. I did a uh, uh, sort of a study of her footsteps in Philadelphia because I'm kind of interested in where she walked and the network she created. And she she has a really rich network of friends and family and what I might call political alliances, um, economic alliances, legal alliances in the city while he's gone. So she's she remains critical to their economic well-being. And she also seems to com- become somewhat political, or maybe not. I mean, on September 16, 1765, Philadelphia experiences a Stamp Act riot, and one of the places they target is the new house that Deborah Franklin has just built for her and Benjamin. So can you tell us why the mob targeted Franklin's house and why and how Deborah attempted to defend it? Well, they... they um it was not unusual for a, a sort of a mob to attack the house of um, elites and political elites, people who they were angry with. And they were angry with Benjamin Franklin because they believed he was responsible for sort of helping implement and push forth the Stamp Act. Uh, he and um, another man were sort of accused of being sort of instrumental in imposing the Stamp Act on the colonies. And he didn't necessarily disagree with it in 1765. Sure, he was responsible for it, but they targeted his and several other houses. But because I care about her and him, this is what I look at. So there was rumors that, um, that the mob was coming. And she knew it, and people were telling her it was coming. Um... And we learn about this, of course, after the incident when she's writing her husband about what happened to it. But she had a friend, a, a cousin, actually, and he's um, cousin Josiah Davenport came and he said, I'm going to I'm coming here to help you because you're alone and you're defenseless um, and I'm going to stay here with you. And so she said to him, it's interesting to me, um, she said to him. You go fetch a gun or two because there's no guns in the house. Well, she so she felt threatened enough that they ought to have guns in the house, and she asked her cousin to go get a gun for her and for him, and they would de- sort of defend their house. Um, and then she says, "I made one room into a magazine. That is basically a sort of a, an artillery um, room." Um, and she said, I ordered some sorts of defense upstairs as I could manage myself. So she went upstairs and she had apparently had this gun in her hand and she was all prepared to defend the house from the mob. Was there any political dimensions to her actions? I mean, surely she wants to protect her house and her things. But is this a statement by Deborah Franklin saying, I'm OK with the Stamp Act or she not have any opinion on it? You know, she's not a very political woman, even though here she is in the midst of a political situation at the start of the of the revolution. I mean, she just sort of uh, gets tossed into it. I'm not sure she would have been involved on her own. She was kind of forced into it. But she, you know, she sort of had comments about sort of this is an internal enemy is the way I would cast it. We'll, we'll talk about Sally later on who's dealing with an external enemy, but it's a mob in the city. And she's sort of saying that this is not the way people behave. 
Um, she's not really talking too much about the Stamp Act itself, but I think I think she's ha- starting to have political thoughts. She writes to Ben a- about the incident, and she says, oh, I'm going to talk to you about it. No, I'm not going to talk to you about it. Yes, I think I'll talk to you about it. And she said, goes that way like four or five times and eventually says, I'm going to talk to you about it because it, it is a sort of a political event. It's written about in the newspaper. She knows that she's reading newspapers. She sees this is happening in other cities because she's talking about reading the newspapers. And it's happening in other places, and she's reading about it, and she knows the political consequences of it. But she sort of steps forward politically and then steps back. She doesn't want to, I would say, step too far out of her domestic realm. She's raised to believe that women, of course, are not supposed to be politically involved. That's the advice literature she was raised on. And so this is, you know, one of those things. Do I do this? Do I not do this? I'm forced to do it. Uh, But she never talks about politics again. After this well, let's leave the story of Deborah Franklin there for a moment, and let's move on to the story of Sally Franklin Beige, the daughter of Deborah and Benjamin Franklin. So besides her famous parentage, can you tell us who Sally was and about her life as the daughter of Benjamin Franklin? Well, it, she too is sort of very interesting and has this mixed relationship with her father, who's kind of controlling and can be prickly at times with her as he was with his wife, Deborah. Um, she, um, was born in 1743. She was, I guess I would consider her a normal teenager and she had friends and she visited and she went to visit them in New Jersey or maybe somewhere else in New York. Um, now the interesting thing probably uh, you might think about her is that when she met Richard Beige, she fell in love with him, and apparently Deborah very much supported the relationship. Benjamin was irate. He did not want Sally to marry Richard because it's sort of, if you think back about what um, Deborah's mother said to her about Benjamin, he's saying the same thing about Richard. He's a failed merchant. He's got debts. He can't support his daughter. He does not want this marriage to happen. Um and his uh, son, William, is sort of saying the same thing about Richard. Well, you know, he's a failed merchant. I don't think this is a good match. But Deborah really believed in this match. And she made sure. She made it happen, basically. She told Benjamin it was going to happen. And it was several years before he would even write to Richard and acknowledge. He said, I was so angry with you and Sally that I, I, it took me a while before I could even write to you and talk to you about this. So they eventually sort of, um, Richard proved himself. He set up a shop the way Benjamin wanted them to. Apparently, um, Sally worked in the shop, um, maybe recreating her mother's life. There's much less evidence about her role, uh, economically in that sense. And so they had a, a, a pretty good marriage. Um, but we really know the most about her is when, um, the British were um, outside of Philadelphia and then eventually occupying the city. And we learn about her politically um, and, and her revolutionary activities. Yeah, let's explore her political life. About 10 years after her mother defends the house from the Philadelphia Stamp Act writers, Sally Franklin Bache becomes, you know, it seems like an ardent patriot and she heads the Ladies Association of Philadelphia. So could you tell us about her political activities? You know, what is the Ladies Association of Philadelphia and how Sally became the head of it? So let me back up. I would argue that her life became politicized sort of in the way her mother's did. So in um, September of 1776, the British are on the outskirts of Philadelphia and their intended target is Philadelphia to come in and occupy the city. She and her family leave Philadelphia temporarily at that point because the British are coming and they don't want to be there. The British don't come. They decided to have winter quarters in New Jersey, so they come back. So then in 17, uh, September of 1777, the British come e- are, are coming in clearly to occupy Philadelphia. And she and her family once again 
evacuate the city. And this time they're gone for about nine months until the British leave. And so I think that's part of that, the politicization of her, is experiencing that turmoil of evacuating the city and thinking about being in a uh, occupied city. And she learns to, I think, more and more hate the British. And she's experiencing it in a ver- the revolution in a very different way than her mother is because she's facing a real external enemy. So I think she sort of learns to become an ardent patriot through that experience. So um, when they come back around 1779, she, uh, w- the movement was spearheaded by Esther de Burt Reed. In 1779, Esther and Sally and some other women get together. Um, and Esther's married to Joseph Reed, who's more like, basically the governor of um, Pennsylvania. He's George Washington's uh, secretary and aide de camp. And so she knows well, Esther knows well from reading letters what dire straits the soldiers are in. They're desperate for food and money and clothing. And so this group of women, um, understanding um, how desperate the situation is, get together and figure out that they're going to do something to help the cause. And the first thing they do is they write this broadside called The Sentiments of American Woman, talking about the role of women as patriots and sort of setting the way for people to begin to understand that women have a clear role to play in the revolution, Um, not just as wives staying home. And and I'm not minimizing that, but staying home and taking care of the family while the men are out, that there's a more active role for them to play. And shortly after this broadside is published, they begin um, a uh, campaign to collect money from the people in Philadelphia. And they go, this group of women, um, probably about 12 women, divide up the city, and they walk the streets of Philadelphia, knocking on doors, asking for contributions to this uh, campaign. They're go- they're gonna, they want to collect money and give it to the soldiers. They think the soldiers need the money. And, and they're pretty successful. They raise a ton of money. Um, but if you think about it, how actually, I hate to say it, revolutionary this was for women to be on the streets, very publicly demonstrating their patriotism, going door to door. They go into taverns. They go into every part of the town. They're not elite ladies just staying in their own elite little neighborhood. They're going all over the city um, collecting money. And if you if you believe the sort of the eyewitness accounts by some loyalist women, you know, they're pretty pushy. They're sort of shoving their hands out and uh, demanding money from people, intimidating them. Who knows if that's true, but that's the way it was perceived by some other women. Um, and so they go about and they raise this money and they were very successful. Um, they even actually uh, just fought, did some research at the New York Historical Society this weekend, and they're writing letters to the countryside, getting their friends there to sort of contribute. So it's not just in the city. Um, and so she becomes quite politicized um, because of what she sees during, before the occupation, uh, when she comes back, the city's in turmoil, there's a lot of dissension. And so I think that politicizes her quite clearly. What do you think it is about the revolution that really politicized women? And do you think it's just urban women or women who live everywhere in the 13 colonies? Because there have been other instances where you've seen political upheaval throughout history. um, And yet women like Deborah Franklin just kind of say, you know, we acknowledge that it's happening, but they don't necessarily take an active role. Where it seems like Sally's generation is taking an active role in political change. Well, in fact, thinking about that question, you know, I thought, well, and I teach women's history, and I thought, we make a great deal of women becoming politicized during the revolution. And we always hold up these role models for these women who take on these roles. And then I got thinking, well, are we overstating the case? Yes, we want to show our female students that women had voice and agency, but to what extent does this really happen? And so I thought a good place for me to start addressing that question, I got two women, 
right in front of me who experience a revolution at different times um, uh, and at different stages of their own life. I mean, Deborah was a much older woman than Sally was. Sally was a, of a young of a younger generation. And so age may have played a part in it. So, but I think we can say that women, um, urban and rural, were involved to some extent. Some weren't involved. Some were involved. There's, it's hard to, to judge that exactly. But I think we need to understand the context of, these, of the revolution itself and who these women are. That's why I wanted to look at Deborah. You know, she's she's um, 58 years old when her house gets attacked. Um, and Sally's in, in her um, 30s. She's 34 years old. So think about that. What would make women more likely to be involved in the revolutionary cause? Maybe just age alone. Um, uh, Deborah's in a Philadelphia that's not really that engaged in the revolution just yet. Sally, you know, brief years later, now is facing these external enemies, and she's seen firsthand um, the extent of what's happening. So I think um, women all over the country, I'm guessing, are making these same kind of decisions and evaluating their lives and where they are in their lives and where the revolution is. And so... um, you're right. Some women did. Some women didn't. And what I don't want to do is disparage the women who didn't, um, because there are reasons they're making decisions that they're making. So, but I don't it's know nice to know they have question. a choice. Yeah. yeah, that's. I mean, women have agency, and there were a lot of loyalist women in Philadelphia, for example, a lot of Quaker women. Um, actually, um, historians are called these. Uh, this group disaffected. They're not really loyalists necessarily. They're Quakers and they're pacifists. And so they just don't believe in war. They tend to support the British more, but you know, they weren't altogether happy when the British invaded Philadelphia either. So, um, but women have agency and women have choice. Well, before we move on to the time warp, if we could just for one last moment, explore the British invasion of Philadelphia how did Sally and Richard protect their property and, and other Philadelphians who were forced to leave? Uh, I'm just wondering, did they have any recourse to protect their houses and their things uh, while the British occupied the city? Well, it depends. So when um, the Bashes left Philadelphia for that that first time when I thought um, the British were um, coming in, they did have a little bit more time and they packed up all of uh, Benjamin's papers and sent them off and they packed up other goods. Um, and so they took some stuff with them because they had the time to sort of do with it, uh, in a, in a less hurried fashion. When, uh, they left Philadelphia, when the British came in to occupy the city, they took almost nothing with them because they did not have the time. Um, and they asked friends to look at the house and protect it, people who were staying there. I mean, their house was, uh, the Franklin house was occupied by a British uh, general at, the whole time. So um, so they didn't have time. Uh, Sally, when she left um, Philadelphia in September of 1777, she had given birth to her third child four days before that. Wow. So think about the turmoil her life was in. She's pregnant. She knows she's about ready to give birth. The British are on the outskirts of the city. What am I going to do? You know, can I have the baby here? Can I leave? So she's in Philadelphia for four days before they leave the city. So that's chaos in and of itself to get a newborn baby and a, a woman who's just given birth to that baby out of the city safely. Yeah, it must have been a very scary time. I can, you know, I have to, I can probably almost write a novel about this, but I think about this poor woman who's being pushed from her house. I mean, not pushed exactly. She had the choice to stay. Um, rebel families did stay. Not everybody got to leave. Um, but here she is. She's getting ready to give birth. The British are on the outskirts. How horrendously scary that must have been to her. And so, so they... Even in that remove, she they lived in, I think, three different places 
um, before they went to Gosham County, and then they went to Trenton, New Jersey, and then they went back to Lancaster County, where someone finally found them a house that was suitable and comfortable enough for them. Uh, but even that, thinking about the moving around she did with that newborn baby, that would politicize somebody, I would think. Yeah, if she wasn't political before, she definitely would have been after, I think. Yes, I think so. You know, there's a lot of her dad also pushing her to be political. Let's be clear about that. I mean, he's sort of telling her that you know, she's writing to him at one point about not having enough finery to go out in public in. And he's chastising her and say, how can you be talking about this stuff when we're in the midst of this revolution and you're not sort of being a good political daughter? He doesn't use those words, but that's sort of what he's saying. I think that motivates her as well. And how important do you think it was for Benjamin that Sally agree with his politics when his son, William, clearly did not? I mean, William is a loyalist and they really stopped speaking. After the revolution. Oh, they absolutely did stop speaking. And But Sally kept up relations with uh, William and his wife until she died, all the way throughout this. And I don't know whether Benjamin thought of her as a traitor or not. And maybe it became more critical for her to be patriot because her, his son was not. But both women, while Benjamin is gone, becomes the public face of Benjamin Franklin. They... At the time, people knew Deborah Franklin. She had a whole cadre of friends. Um, she sort of kept his reputation out there alive and sort of being a good wife. And I think the daughter did the exact same thing. She's the daughter of Benjamin Franklin, who's sort of now in uh, France and uh, even a more ardent patriot himself. And so I think it's critical. He, he drives them to be more political or at least Sally, to be more political. I think he can't quite deal with Deborah being political. I know we could talk about this for hours, and I still have plenty we of could. questions, but I'll, I'll have to wait for the book. But um, I, it's time for us now to move on to the time warp. Now, this is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. So, Vivian, are you ready for your time warp question? I am. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Okay. In your opinion, what might have happened if Deborah Franklin had lived as long as Benjamin? Do you think she would have been an active revolutionary? Do you think she would have gone to Paris? And would her existence have changed history in any way? I think a lot about this, actually, when, especially when I was writing this you know, article on generations, because I compare her with Benjamin's sister, Jane Meekham, who at the same time as Deborah was involved in a lot of these um, so-called political incidents and didn't really become politicized, Jane didn't either early on. But we know Jane lived long enough to become politicized. She became more and more politically aware and more and more politically engaged with her brother. They wrote about politics all the time. I, I, I want to say that Deborah probably would have become more political, but I'm, I, I don't know what makes me say that other than she would have, she's a spunky woman. She defended her house. She knew what her rights were and maybe faced more and more with, um, sort of the, the British opposition, she might have become more political. But on the other hand, she's of that generation um, that doesn't really think women should be politically involved. And so I don't know how to answer that question. I guess she would be more politically engaged. I don't think she would have ever been as politically engaged as her as her uh, daughter was. And I, you know, if she's writing to Ben, he's got to allow her to be political or not. And he had no interest in talking with her very much about politics. So you don't think she would have gone to Paris with him? Because I, I can just imagine her being there and, you know, a lot of the way he was able to sway power, you know, sentiment mm -hmm. towards the American favor was by flirting with other women. <laughs> Of course, you know, the story is she didn't go with him to England because she was afraid to death of sailing. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, she was just terrified. Now, historians sort of, some historians sort of really get after, come on, you're really afraid to sail. Um, 
But I was doing some research um, at the Library of Congress of Philadelphia, and I said, I'm going to look at the newspapers. And there's articles galore in the newspapers about ships that run aground, ships that sink, people that die, pirates that board ships and, you know, uh, kidnap people or kill people. In some sense, there's a real fear of, I mean, I think it's, it's like me being afraid to fly. Um, so she's afraid to sail. So in that sense, I don't think she would have gone to Paris either. I mean, I don't know what would have gotten her over that sort of fear of sailing. I can't blame her because after we heard Joyce Chaplin talk to us about what it's like to live on a boat for months on end, you know, even just six weeks, I'm not sure I would want to experience it. Well, and he even wrote her experiences about, oh, my God, the, you know, we've trying to get into port and we ran into a sort of a hurricane or it was really terrible and people were sick because the boat was rocking so much. So, yeah, I don't blame her either. Heck, you know, when he left her in 1763, they had just built a brand new house. Why wouldn't she stay back and sort of settle it in and live uh, safely? Because he promised he'd be back every year. Um, because of course he never saw her alive after he after he left. So, um, but um, would her existence have changed history? Probably not. And I always get people. I say, well, why do Deborah? And some sense I do Deborah because she is an uh, a fairly ordinary woman woman in Philadelphia, and we need to understand what sort of women who live day to day lives do. Um, uh, we know a lot about extraordinary women. Let's try and understand ordinary women more and more. They No, they don't change history, but that doesn't mean that they're not worth looking at. So I don't think she would have changed history. So before we conclude, would you tell us about when we should be on the lookout for your forthcoming book, The Worlds of Deborah Reed Franklin and Sally Franklin Bache, and whether you have chosen your next research project? Well, I'm guessing this project is uh, a couple years out. I'm not going on to anything else yet till this is done. <laughs> Where's the best place to look for more information about you and where we can learn about when your book will be released? I think the best place to do would be to go to the Ithaca College website and uh, type in my name, Vivian Bruce Conger or Vivian Conger, and I try to keep my information updated on my webpage. And nobody will have to search for you because we'll have a link to your email and a link to your Wonderful. Ithaca College page on the show notes page. You know, as vain as I am, I Google myself, and you can just Google Vivian Bruce Conger and find out all sorts of stuff about me. (laughs) Great. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today, Vivian. Thanks a lot. I really appreciated it, Liz. I must say, I am really impressed with how independent Deborah Reed Franklin was. As Vivian mentioned, Ben left her to supervise his domestic affairs in Philadelphia while he traveled to England. First, for a span of five years between 1757 and 1762, and then for 10 years between 1765 and 1775. But rather than pine away for Benjamin, Deborah made a life for herself. And she made sure that Ben's affairs were in order for when he returned to Philadelphia. So she seems like quite the remarkable woman. And Sally Franklin Beige also strikes me as an impressive woman. Her involvement with and leadership of the Ladies Association of Philadelphia placed her in a position to both comment on and participate in politics, which is not something you normally think of women doing until well into the 19th century. You can find information about Vivian, her forthcoming book, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, which you'll find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 022. It's been a while, but just as a friendly reminder, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate and review this podcast, because your rating and review will help us keep Ben Franklin's world visible and findable for new people. To rate and review Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history, just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash iTunes or benfranklinsworld.com slash Stitcher. And finally... After listening to Dane Morrison in episode 12 discuss what it was like to sail to China in the 1780s, and Joyce Chaplin discuss early around the world sea voyages in episode 15, what say you? Would you have made a transatlantic crossing in the mid to late 18th century, such as the one that faced Deborah Franklin? Email me your answers 
Liz at BenFranklin'sWorld.com or tweet me at Liz Kovart. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.